Sit back. Relax. Unless you're driving. It's time for That's a Freebie. You are listening to That's a Freebie, the only podcast that mixes all the latest news from my little world with interesting stories from the rest of the world. I'm your host, Diggy, and in the background, you can probably hear the rabbit going crazy because she is having one of those days where she just wants to hop about, chew on the bars, and go absolutely mad. So she's my guest host for today. Welcome, Nightshade. Oh, she can't speak. Okay, well, let's start with an Ask a Freebie question then instead. Uh, This is where I answer a question from you, the listener. Uh, This week's question is an anonymous question, and I think I see why it's anonymous, although I could probably guess who might have sent this in. Uh, But I'm not going to guess because you asked to remain anonymous. Uh, It is, (sighs) do you excuse yourself when you fart and you are alone? The answer is yes, I do. I was brought up to be a good boy and to always say, excuse me, if I burp or I fart or I do something that would normally require you to say that in a public environment. So, yes, if I'm in the house on my own and I let one rip, I absolutely say, oh, excuse me. Or what I do sometimes, and I say sometimes, I do this pretty much all of the time, is uh, my mum used to have a pig. Not a real pig, like a teddy bear pig. And you would squeeze its belly and it would go, and then it'd go, oh, pardon me. So if I'm in the house on my own and I do a fart, I always go, oh, pardon me. Yeah. So if you would like to ask a question to open up the show, just head to the show notes or that's a freebie.com where you will find a link to the fairly new multi-purpose feedback form. I say fairly new. It's been around for a few months now. Uh, and that allows you to submit a question for Ask a Freebie. It also lets you submit a Pogtails topic or send in general feedback as well. Your feedback doesn't have to be read out on the show. You get to choose. I have quite a few topics for you this week. Uh, three that are basically me complaining about something. And one that is... Essentially, just something I saw that was interesting and a bit bizarre, and I still don't know anything about it. Let's start with that one, actually, because, it, well, yeah, it's it's strange. So about two days ago, I think it was now, I was I was driving uh, to go and pick the kids up and from school. I turned to the corner, and in the middle of the road, all I could see was a load of pretty large stones is probably the best way of putting it. Maybe rocks. I won't quite classify them as rocks. I won't say they were big enough to be called rocks, but they were big and surrounded by children watching them. So I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. So obviously I, I slowed down and then eventually I, I stopped because the kids were stood in the road and they're waving their arms at me. I'm like, oh, okay, what's going on? Uh, I went my window down, had a look out, and it turned out these stones were not stones at all. They were giant snails. Now, I don't know if you would call them giant snails, but they were big-ass snails, right? They weren't tiny. They were massive. Like, I could probably have just about comfortably held one in my hand. Uh, I would not have done, but I probably could have if I tried to. And they were huge. Uh, And there was about seven or eight of them just crossing the road. Uh, So where they came from, I don't know. I almost went into Cotton Eye Joe then, didn't I? Uh, Where did they come from? Where did they go? Well, they came from one side of the street and they went to the other side of the street. Um, And I turned around and went the opposite way because I didn't want to crush any of them because these kids were also standing in the road going, ah, don't crush them. So I didn't crush them because the kids would probably have cried. Yeah, giant snails. Wasn't expecting that on my trip to pick the kids up from school. So, moan number one. For a lot of people in Manchester, you will know that this week there was a, a derailment of a uh, a Metrolink tram. And that's not my moan, obviously. I hope everyone was okay. Uh, all that kind of stuff. I don't, you know, I'm, it's a, this, this stuff happens. That's not a problem. My moan is that when it happened, they put signs up on the platforms, on the digital signs, and they said, 
Uh, office was early in the morning anyway. They probably said other things throughout the course of the day. It had just happened when I got to the tram station. And it said, due to a tram derailment in the city, the trams are only going to Wharfside, uh, which is a stop along the way. Uh, which is not the stop I need to go to. I need to go to the two or three stops after that. So a bit stuck. Uh, it said, there is no replacement bus service, but tickets are being accepted on the 250, 255 and 256 buses. So I was like, okay, well, what I will do is turn around and drive back to the Trafford Centre and get the bus from there because it's just easier for me. And also it means I can get on the X50, which is an express bus. So I did that. Uh, all was fine. It was dead handy, actually. I got I got there, packed up. There was a bus waiting. I got straight on it and it cost me £2 because uh, they weren't accepting the tickets on the X50. Not a problem. Uh, I don't mind paying £2. Gets on the bus, driving along. And when it got to the wharfside stop, that's when I realised that the buses they were advertising as accepting tickets, the 250, the 255 and the 256, don't actually go anywhere near that stop. They're about a 15-minute walk from that stop. The only one that actually goes past that stop is the X50, the express one. And so there was an enormous queue of people that had not been able to complete their tram journeys waiting to get on this bus. It took 25 minutes for everybody to get on the bus and pay for their tickets and then get get on, on board the bus. And they still couldn't fit everybody on it. So uh, it turned out not to be quicker. And it turned out that everybody was a bit peeved because they had to pay for their tickets when they were expected not to. So, yeah, that was a little bit annoying uh, because it took longer, essentially. Bone number two. See, this is better than having a whole buzz-off section, isn't it? Because I can just put it all together. Uh, they have put temporary traffic lights up in the town where I live, and I'm all for them. They're actually really, really good. Uh, the idea is, is it's uh, to make crossing the road easier for the children uh, during school pick-up and drop-off times. Uh, but it is also easing some of the congestion of traffic as well, because what was causing the c congestion is people being idiots and essentially blocking the entrances and exits to roads whilst waiting in the traffic that's already there. And so everyone was just at a standstill because no one could get anywhere. A bit like when you stop at a yellow box junction when you shouldn't do. And it actually causes more congestion than it does. That's what was happening. So they put, I could, well, there's, there's three sets of temporary traffic lights that I'm aware of that they've put up. There's probably more than in places that I don't go. And it seems to be a mixed reaction. A lot of drivers who don't have children going to school are annoyed at them. And a lot of drivers that uh, do have children going to school are uh, seeing the benefit of them. And so it's a little bit of a mixture. I mean, my, my view is, is a lot of the drivers that are complaining about them are people that are complaining that the rush hour traffic is really, really bad and it's making it worse because they're having to sit at more traffic lights. Now, the obvious answer to that really is set off earlier. <laughs> like, I understand like that it's not always as simple as that, blah, 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 blah. But honestly, just just leave earlier. Like, if you don't want to get caught in traffic, that you're getting caught in anyway, leave earlier. It's it's not hard. If you arrive to your work too early, it's an opportunity to have a sit down and a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a croissant, anything before you start your job. Give yourself those, that bit of time in the morning as free time. That solves your problem. Anyway, the part that was annoying me about it, because believe it or not, none of that was the bit that was annoying it, right? The part that annoys me is one of the people that complained uh, didn't complain about the traffic lights, didn't complain about anything else. So the, the, the school are the people that have asked for the feedback on it, and they're, they're going to pass it on to the council. And it was done in a public message thread on um, on an app that the school use. I don't think the teacher intended that to happen, but it's just what happened. And one of the parents complained about where other parents are parking. They said, There's a road called Church Road, basically, and... They've complained that too many people park at the top of Church Road. And for whatever reason, it, it's making it hard for them. Now, I park at the top of Church Road, along with quite a few other people. And there is a reason why we park at the top of Church Road. It's because it is the designated parking area for the school. 
they've asked people not to, to drive down the street that the school's on and park on Church Road instead because it is a much wider road. It's essentially, it's, it's actually a two-lane road, but it's as wide as a four-lane road. Uh, there is loads of space. There is absolutely no issue with parking there whatsoever. You know what annoys me about the most of it? It's the person who complained. It's the person who parks in front of me on Church Road in his Land Rover, right? So every morning, he stops in the middle of Church Road and tries to back up in between two cars, mine and the car in front, right? He backs up terribly, I might say. He cannot drive his car to save his life, right? He backs up. He gets into the space eventually after about 17 maneuvers. Uh, and it's it's an easily doable thing. He just parks way into the middle of the road and then doesn't give himself enough space to get round. It's really bizarre, right? And then he's got four kids and they throw the doors open on the car without a care in the world. And every morning he's, you, you hear him go, oh, watch the doors, what are you doing? Instead of putting the child locks on. That's his problem. It's his complete inability to park that is causing the problem. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit mad. Uh, everybody's been moaning about this guy now, which is quite funny. Uh, he got a load of messages saying, I, I think you might find that you're the issue here, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, it's typical school stuff. Uh, it's amazing the, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I suppose the bitchiness that goes on with uh, people in, with parents, I suppose, in schools behind one another's back. I am not immune to it. I am just as bad, except the thing that, obviously most people don't realize is that I am always right. So, oh, well, sucks to be them. And my third and final complaint for this week is not so much a complaint, more of a, a perplexing situation that I was in. Um, yesterday, in fact, I pulled up to at the car park for the Metrolink. Very Metrolink heavy uh, day this today, isn't it? Um, I pulls up, I parked up and as I was getting my bag out of the boot, I closed the boot and I turned around and there was a guy stood behind me and I'm not talking like a little bit right behind me. I bumped into him and I went, ah, oh, hello. And he, he went, what are the hours of this car park? And I thought, uh, is this some sort of parking inspector and I've done something wrong and I've not realized. And I, I stepped around him. And I went, uh, I don't know, um, but I think it's open 24 hours. I'm not 100% on that, though. Uh, and then and then he said, well, if I wanted to park on this car park late at night, is that OK? And I, I said, I don't know, but there are a lot of signs around that you can read, and I'm sure they will tell you. I usually park here till quite late at night. And then in my dad, I'm going, oh, my God, don't tell him what time you're coming back. What are you doing, you idiot? Uh, and I was like, but it varies uh, day to day. Like, for example, today, I don't know what time I'll be coming back, but I'm, I feel safe in the knowledge that if it is late, the car park will be open and there will be plenty of security here. <laughs> and uh, he, he goes, hmm, OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. And then he said, how do I board the Metrolink? And I was like, um, well, it's it's just over there. So you, you go over there and you get on it. And he said, yeah, but what do I do? How do I make the doors open? Do they open automatically? I'm like, oh, you press a button and the doors open. Right. Okay. And then he said, which stop do I need to get on at? So I was like, well, where are you going? Uh, and he went, I'm going into the city center. I'm like, okay, so it's over there. And it's the furthest stop from us. There's, there's two sides to it. It's, there's, it's the opposite side to where we are now. And then he says, how do I pay for it? Like, well, there are multiple ways of paying for it. I was like, um, what's going on here? So I said, well, you could use a tick the ticket machine or you can tap your card on the terminal or you can buy a ticket in the app. And he went, oh, there is a terminal, is there? Okay, I'll use the terminal then. Right. And then he just stood there silent, staring at me. And it freaked me out a little bit. So I started sort of backing up and I went, okay. And he went, yeah, the reason I ask is I'm coming here for the football later tonight. So I want to make sure I know what I'm doing before I get here. I was like, brilliant. See you later. I've got just a few more questions. And th that was when I just couldn't take any more. I, I went, you do know I don't work here, right? <laughs> and he went, oh, do you not? Uh, I was like, no, why would you think I work here? I'm not, 
I'm not wearing a Metrolink uniform in any way. I had the uniform on for the place that I do work, which I'm not mentioning. Um, and it's very obvious that it's not related to the Metrolink. And he looked at me and he went, oh, I thought you did. Okay, bye. Thanks for your help. You were very helpful. And I, I just I walked away very quickly. Very weird situation. I, I kind of get what he was doing, but for some reason, he thought I worked at the Metrolink. That's what I couldn't get my head around, really, because there was absolutely nothing to indicate that that might be the case. In 1992, Pepsi Philippines launched a promotion that seemed like a pretty sweet deal. It was called Pepsi Number Fever. All you had to do was buy Pepsi. That was pretty simple, right? Then you check the number printed on the inside of the bottle cap. And if your number matched the winning one that was announced on TV, you could win big. Up to 1 million pesos, which is about $40,000 at the time. Maybe not now. Uh, sounds all right, yeah? Pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward, yeah? Well, it was. Until things went horribly wrong. The promotion kicked off in February 1992, with numbers printed inside the caps of Pepsi, 7-Up, Mountain Dew, and Mirinda bottles. Never heard of Mirinda. I imagine it's a drink that's probably only sold in the Philippines. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong. Uh, if you found the right number, you could win anything from 100 pesos which is about $4, to a grand prize of 1 million pesos, which is a huge sum. Uh, or it was in the Philippines back then. Uh, people went crazy for it, as you can imagine. I seem to recall something similar, actually, when I was a kid. I remember on cans you would get, it was either a number underneath the pull tab or there'd be like a dot of some kind. I might have to look that up. I can't quite remember what it was, but I remember something similar. I don't remember them being anything to do with the TV, though, where they read a number out. Uh, I think you matched it either on a website or it's a phone number. I can't quite remember now. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, the sales of Pepsi shot up through the roof. Uh, the promotion was even extended past its original end date because it was such a success. And by May, uh, 51,000 people had already claimed prizes. So that that's claimed prizes. Think about how many people must have actually participated in it. Um, and 17 of those won the grand prize uh, and everything was going great for Pepsi. And that was until the night of May 25th, when they announced the number that changed everything. That number was 349. Now, this has also been known as the 349 incident, uh, interestingly. Um, that night on the popular news program TV Patrol, Pepsi announced that the winning number was 349. But here's the thing. Pepsi had already printed 800,000 caps with the number 349 without a special security code that is needed to claim the big prize. Eek. Uh, people didn't know that these caps weren't meant to win. So thousands of people rushed to the Pepsi bottling plants thinking they'd hit the jackpot. Pepsi quickly tried to explain that the real winning caps had a security code and that 349 caps without it weren't actually valid. And to make matters worse, the next morning, the newspapers added to the confusion by saying the winning number was actually 134. So as you can imagine, chaos was brewing. Uh, Pepsi scrambled to make things right. They offered 500 pesos, which is about $18 as a goodwill gesture to those with the non-winning 349 caps. While many people accepted the offer, a large number didn't. As you can imagine, uh, they were furious over what they saw as a broken promise. These people formed a group called the 349 Alliance. They boycotted Pepsi and started holding protests. At first, the protests were peaceful. Uh, but things, as often with this kind of thing, turned violent. In February 1993, a homemade bomb was thrown at a Pepsi truck, killing a school teacher and a five-year-old child. A few months later, three Pepsi employees were killed in another attack. In total, at least 37 Pepsi trucks were damaged or destroyed during these protests. Uh, the situation got so heated that Pepsi executives received death threats. And some even claimed that Pepsi was behind the attacks to make the protesters look bad. The scandal was spiraling out of control. The whole less led the whole less? 
The whole mess led to a mountain of lawsuits. Around 22,000 people filed legal claims against Pepsi with both civil and criminal complaints. Pepsi did pay a fine of 150,000 pesos uh, to the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry for not following the rules of their own contests, but the lawsuits just kept on coming. Uh, years later, in 2006, the Philippine Supreme Court finally put an end to the legal drama. They ruled that Pepsi wasn't responsible for paying out any of the prize money for the misprinted caps. And just like that, the saga of the 349 incident was over. Or at least legally, anyway. The Pepsi number fever scandal left a mark. Pepsi's market share in the Philippines took an absolute nose drive. Nose drive, nose dive, uh, dropped to just 17% of the market. But they did bounce back uh, by 1994, climbing back to 21% of the market. And believe it or not, Pepsi even got an award, although not the kind you'd normally want. They won the 1993, uh, I think that's LG Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, a spoof of the real Nobel Prize. I've never heard of that before, actually. Uh, for bringing many warring factions together for the first time in the nation's history. Not exactly a win, but it's something. Uh, in the end, Pepsi number no. fever became one of the most infamous marketing disasters of all time. I said that weirdly then, didn't I? Infamous marketing disasters of all time. It started as a fun bottle cap promotion, but turned into a nationwide scandal. If there's one lesson to take away from it, it's this. Be very careful with your numbers especially when millions of people are paying attention. Don't forget, you can send in your own topics for Podtails by using the multi-purpose feedback form, which is at thatsafreebie.com, or it's in the show notes. This week, I'm asking you to go and listen to the Incomparable Game Show as the podcast of the week. Uh, you may recall last week, I talked of the Incomparable, which is a podcast about all things nerdery uh, and pop culture related. And they also do a podcast called Game Show. And it is quite literally what it sounds like. It is a game show. Uh, it's multiple game shows. though. They do a Trivial Pursuit one, um, which is actually named Random Pursuit. They do a, a, a feuding families type one, or family fortunes as we would call it in the UK. Uh, they do all kinds of games, essentially. Um, and that is what they do. They play games. It's fun. Uh, you get to hear people have a laugh and you end up having a laugh with them because it's almost impossible not to. Uh, check it out in the show notes. There is a link to it. Uh, if you're after a fun podcast uh, with a nice big back catalogue that you can go back and listen to, uh, previous episodes this would be the one to go for because it is exactly that if you want even more that's a freebie then you should join that's a freebie plus just head to the show notes or that's a freebie.com and click the link there you can join for just four pound a month your membership gets you the plus feed of the show which is sent out immediately after it's recorded which includes almost zero edits other than long gaps so you can hear me plan the show and hear all of my mistakes this feed includes the exclusive that's a freebie plus segment at the end of the show and if you can't do that or you don't want to that's okay you can still help by sharing the show far and wide and leaving a review in your favorite podcast client of choice Don't forget to uh, go onto your favorite podcast client and uh, add a review for the podcast and uh, share it far and wide with all your family. You can get in touch with me at that'safreebie.com or you can go to pretty much any social media and find me as either Hey It's Diggy or um, That's a Freebie Podcast uh, on pretty much everything. Uh, I'm going to leave you this week with just one final little story. Uh, I, I've been in the market for a little while for, uh, a, like a little portable radio. Uh, I like to, I just, I like to listen to the radio. I'm a bit old fashioned like that. Um, we can't afford to have a smart speaker in every room and nor would we want to have a smart speaker in every room. So I just, I've always had this little radio that I carry around anyway, it finally gave up. So, uh, as you can imagine, I've been searching, uh, the internet to try and find a decent replacement 
Uh, I actually saw an ad for one because obviously I was served ads because I was searching for it. Uh, and he'd actually said um, that they're selling one uh, and it's half price. Uh, but for some reason, the volume is stuck on full. Uh, and I thought, oh, wow. Well, I can't turn that down. 